Flo and Kay are the world's only female autistic savant twins. Genius, smart and intelligent. Give them a date and they will instantly compute the day of the week. November 30th, 1938. Oh yeah, yeah, Wednesday. Flo and Kay can name the artist of any song from the 60s, 70s or 80s. Hold me tight. Johnny Nash, Johnny Nash. Lady Willpower. The Yogi Gap. A Place in the Sun. Are you dying Ross? Dying Ross? Recall the weather on any given date. It was so hot, about 91, 92. And even remember what their favorite TV hosts wore on a particular day. A gray suit and, and blue tie. They are unique. In some ways, they are retarded, and in some ways, they're geniuses. The world might never have known about their amazing talents if local news anchor Dave Wagner had not befriended Flo and Kay. These are two people the world has never seen and two people the world may never see again. But Dave had no idea about the secrets of their childhood and the dramatic revelations that lay in wait. Our father really never put a stop to it, really. He, he would always pretend it didn't happen. Dave will take Flo and Kay to meet the world's leading experts on savantism. In terms of identical twin female savants, I don't know of any others in the world. This is the story of Flo and Kay. When I saw the movie Rain Man, I said, oh my God, it's them. Unique, identical twin savants. Flo and Kay Lyman are 52-year-old identical twins. The platters, the five satins. They have extraordinary memories. They never forget anything that's happened to them. Why does really take you back here, Dick Clark's music? They've listened to music all their lives and can remember every record they've ever heard. Salsa Orchestra, Double Exposure, Cowboys. Dave Wagner has been a friend of theirs for 20 years. In 1988, he was a news anchor in Tampa Bay, Florida, when one night he received a call from two unknown viewers. Picked up the phone, it was Flo and Kay, and they began to sort of pepper me with a, a series of of questions about my life, uh, about when I was born, uh, what I liked, my dislikes, really a litany of questions that I was not really used to, but uh, they definitely appeared to be, you know, friendly viewers and very, you know, engaging and interested. Over the years, Dave has developed a friendship with Flo and Kay. Day after day by a bite. By bad finger. Finger. When did that come out? January, January 1972. What about Alone Again Naturally? Who was or, that? Or, 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 Sullivan had, 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 had came out July of 1972. Love will keep us together. The, the Captain Antonio, and it came out in May 1975. It's unbelievable. I my first job was as a disc jockey, and I thought I had a pretty good grip on music here. And this kind of quizzing started out when I was working at the TV station, where I was I was asking them while they were on the telephone. I would quiz them with these records, and their recall is amazing. Some of us might be able to recall that song after, you know, 30 seconds or so, but it's on the tip of their tongue. It's always right there. Disco Lady. Oh, yeah, Johnny Taylor, and I came out April 1976. Laughter in the Rain. Neil Sedaka, and I came out de de December of 74. A fifth of Beethoven. All right, and Walter Murphy and the Big Apple Band, and I, and, came, and I came out August 1976. Lady. Yeah, yeah, which version? <laughs> There's a couple of them. Who, who sang it? Oh, 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 yeah, well, this one is by the Sticks. Oh, and there's one, and by, I, and there's one by the Little River Band, and there's one by Kenny Rogers. There's three of them? Yeah. Really? The three of them is well, what we know. How do you remember these things? <laughs> How do you do this? <laughs> do you like that? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. yeah that was neat. Oh, yeah. Dave found out that Flo and Kay were autistic savants. An autistic savant is someone whose mental disability contains an inexplicable area of genius in a specialized field like mathematics or music. After knowing Flo and Kay for several years, Dave began to make items about them for his local news station. For 39 years, Flo and Kay were told they were mentally retarded. What family and friends didn't realize is that Flo and Kay Lyman are rare autistic savants with incredible abilities. They never forget a day of the week. What day of the week was January 14, 1969? Uh, Tuesday. Never forget what they ate. What did you eat on January 10th, 1994? Oh, for dinner, we had pork chops, we had mixed vegetables and baked potato. What did you drink? I had yeah, mint tea. Yeah, mint tea. Never forget the weather on any day over the past 30 years. 
March 13th, 1993. Oh, that's where we had the no name storm. And how do you remember all these things? Oh, very easy. <laughs> Dave has been so fascinated by Flo and Kay's story that he's filmed them on and off for 13 years. Today, Dave is taking them to meet Daryl Treffert, the world's foremost expert on savantism. Well, we're coming to Wisconsin Fond du Lac to, to meet Dr. Daryl Treffert, who uh, was a consultant for the movie Rain Man. This visit will you know, prove to the world that Flo and Kay are incredibly unique people that the world you know, has never seen and may never see again. How you doing? Oh, all good. All, all good. good. Doing okay. Where were you born? Where were you born? Actually, I was born in Fond du Lac. Oh, that's, oh. that's nice. Are you generally happy, you two? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Darrell Trafford has been studying savantism for 40 years. He will determine how Flo and Kay's amazing skills match up to those of other well-known savants. I, I, we've flown about uh, two times. When's the first time you went on a plane? On June 23rd, 1975, and it was a hot, steamy Monday evening. We remember that. It was a Monday. I see. Okay. And do you keep track of a lot of different kinds of dates? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. How come you do that? Why do you, you just like oh, to do that? Oh, yeah. It's just up in our memory. Uh-huh. Can you tell me the day of the week and the date when, when President Reagan was... Yeah, yeah, Monday. Yeah, it was Monday, March the 30th. Uh, uh, 1981 to 30 in the afternoon. That's right. That's that's correct. And John Lennon? Oh, 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 Monday, December 8th, 1980, mm. uh, 11 o'clock at night. Well, there's no question but that is a savant syndrome phenomena. No question at all. Savant syndrome is a rare but spectacular condition in which somebody with a developmental disability, including but not necessarily limited to autism, has some island of genius that stands in stark mark contrast to overall handicap. The prodigious savants are people whose skills would be spectacular even if they were to be seen in a non-disabled person. Ordinarily, we'd call them a prodigy or a genius. I used to say there were fewer than 25 known living savants worldwide. I'm up to about 100 now. Dave Wagner has known for many years that Flo and Kay are autistic savants. We are human computers. We remember everything from the past. It just comes. Now, their genius has been confirmed by the world's leading expert on savantism. Their memory and their categorization of things is truly uh, remarkable. That is a savant syndrome phenomenon, no question at all. Of these 100, Flo and Kay are the only identical twin sisters among them. It seems that they can remember everything that has ever happened to them. As children, Flo and Kay's abilities were neither recognized nor understood. Nobody made any attempt to understand what was going on in their world, so their condition remained undiagnosed. Back in 1956, there weren't a lot of avenues for the mom to get help. I think it was a big burden on her and a lot of stress, and I don't think she was able to handle it. These children are significant burdens on many, many families. You're not dealing with just two special needs. They're twins, so there's a lot more going on. She had four small children, and she was alone. It was clear they had some kind of impairment. They couldn't do a lot of things for themselves. Had they been diagnosed in 1956, um, the parents would have been ch um, blamed for the condition. Blaming sp specifically mothers, calling them refrigerator mothers, flat, affect, cold. And these children demonstrated their lack of engagement pure and simply as a defense mechanism. It's almost like having a child in the terrible twos for a long, long time. And so you can see that it's quite a stress on the families. Many of these families were stigmatized by society, and there was a huge embarrassment factor. Mom never talked about it. I wasn't told anything. I just knew they were different. I knew they were twins, but they were different than other twins that I had met. And uh, my parents never spoke about it. But their mother couldn't keep them home all the time. And when they left the house, they would be preyed upon by the neighborhood bullies. They were ridiculed a lot. A lot of people made fun of them and I, I would always come to the rescue. 
When they got a little older, in high school years, it was a little bit harder for them. There were a few, a few, a few people in the, in the neighborhood that was mean. They would, they would call us all kind of names, like four eyes, four eyes, or R word, and everything. They were, they reach art, just slow poke, goofy, like just like what our mother did. There were times when Flo and Kay fought back. What kind of a mother are you? Oh, but then she would get mad. She would lock us in our room. A lot of people were afraid of her. She was a tough woman. She was a mean, mean woman ever since I knew her. She was like sort of on a bossy side compared with our father. But our father really never put a stop to it, really. He, he would always pretend it didn't happen. She was mean, because you know she was mean, because you know that story. I don't want to have to get into that story. That story was that she tried to kill her children. I believed that she was manic depressive, also an alcoholic. She was depressed and she was, she was, she, she, she wanted to have thoughts of suicide. She wanted some suicidal thoughts. One night, their mother went downstairs to the kitchen and turned the gas on. I remember the girls and mom had their heads in the oven and I would remember crying, I wouldn't do it. And she says, no, mom, don't you, don't you there. Don't you, don't you there. They're, they're my sisters, and I'd like to, and I'd leave, like to have them around with me. I remember running out and getting help, and it, it's, it's kind of a blur. The girls remember it more in detail. So she went upstairs and got our father out of, out of bed, and our father called the cops. The police officers just gave Mom a lecture and just told her never to do this again and left. And she says, I'm sorry, girls. I, 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 I won't do that. I, I, I won't do that anymore. I, I, I will never do that again. I will never do that again. I, I, I'm sorry I scared you. Autism was little understood in the 1960s, and Flo and Kay's childhood was consequently very hard. Nowadays, they appear to be outgoing and sociable. They don't fit the autistic stereotype. So just how autistic are they? At the New Jersey Neuroscience Institute, Flo and Kay's brains are examined to determine whether there might be some underlying cause. We're at JFK. Hospital in, in Edison, New Jersey, getting our brain scans done to see our, if our memory is perfect. And like if I have the Apple computer and Catherine have the Microsoft, <laughs> because the calendars, all the calendars, and all the people's birthdays and that way that we, we remember. How's that? You warming up? Thank you. Is that like for protection for radiation? No, it's just to keep you warm. Oh. The left side of the brain controls language and reasoning skills, while the right side controls intuition and unconscious calculating ability. If there's damage to the left side of their brains, the right side might be compensating, which might go some way to explaining just why they have such phenomenal memories. These are the pictures of your brain. Right. Um, this is uh, Catherine's on this side. This is Florence on that side. Oh! Your brains look very similar, just like you guys look similar. Really? So, yeah. And uh, everything was normal and everything looks good there. So. Good, good. good. So we're, we're glad. We're all happy about that. The scans reveal nothing unusual. Wow, that, that is neat. Yeah, so everything's normal. Nice. Everything's right where it should be, yeah. Good, good. Here. What's it like? There are no abnormalities within their brains to explain their amazing abilities. Oh, boy. oh my gosh, that's neat. What makes you feel happy? A excitement, mu music, ro rock and roll concerts, concerts. Nancy Eisenberg, director of behavioral science at the Institute, is finding out just how autistic the twins are. And how does it feel inside? Joyful. Joyful, like what does that feel like inside of you? Can oh, yeah, you like describe how it feels? Uh, like, uh, like Peppy. Florence, let me ask you. Okay. All right? Yes. Can you tell me the name? of one of your closest friends. Cindy Fledger. OK, Cindy Fledger. He, yes. Yeah. And how often do you see her? Well, last, last we saw her was, was on our birthday in 1995. So that was a while ago. Yes, it was. I use the Autism Diagnosis and Observation Scale, the ADOS, to diagnose autism. You conduct an, an interview asking about um, friendships, you ask them about emotions, and then you observe how they describe emotions, how they use gesture, how they modulate eye contact. Tell me how this sounds. Today's a nice day. Uh, angry. 
Okay. How about you try? Okay. If you were trying to say it in a sad tone of voice. I'm having a nice day. Okay, and how about, can you try to say it in an angry voice? I'm having a nice day. <laughs> First impressions were that they had very minimal eye contact. Their voice was poorly modulated, and they would talk quite animatedly about their area of interest, but otherwise wouldn't engage me in conversation. So they really did show the classic um, signs that we see in individuals with autistic spectrum disorder. How did you know then that you knew the days of the week from the date? Oh, oh, from, from the calendar. We looked Dr. Eisenberg goes on to test the twins' savant skills. And what day of the week was that? Oh, that was a Monday. January 15th, 1983. Or oh, 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 that was a Saturday. May 2nd, 1984. Wednesday. That was a Wednesday. September 15th, 2001 was which day? Saturday. February 29th, 1976. Oh, yeah, yeah, Sunday. Dr. Eisenberg then tries the twins out on a date long before they were born, something it was previously assumed they were incapable of calculating. And what about... If we said November 30th, 1938. Oh, yeah, yeah, Wednesday. Yes, indeed, it is Wednesday. Oh, my so God. How do you do that? Are you counting it, or does it just come to you? Actually, it's, a, it's up in our brain. We think we have a microchip up there. Uh-huh. It remains an enigma. We don't really understand how the computation is made in the brain. Until we can account for the savant, we can't account for brain function overall. Until we can explain the savant, we really can't explain ourselves. I see Flo and Kay as, as human beings, not simply human computers, but Flo and Kay oftentimes you know, repeated to me and continue to this day, hey, Dave Wagner, we're human computers. The world is often a confusing place for people with autism. Flo and Kay have devised unusual strategies for coping with the confusion that surrounds them. This is, going to, this is the box of crayons that we're going to be using in the door, the door and all of our color charts. And now... Since they were children, Flo and Kay have made charts which catalog what their favorite celebrities wear every time they appear on television. We have kept, kept in a, maybe about 900 to 10,000 color charts over the past 34 years, since 1974. Ladies, find everything you were looking for? Yes, yes we did. Thank Good. you. The world for many and most people with autism is hugely confusing just like it is for all of us in some respects. But for them, it's hugely confusing because they have so many sensorial issues, hyper levels of sensate and vision, hypo levels in touch sometimes, and then the senses don't work harmoniously. They don't work in synchrony. And so the more that they can create order, the more secure they feel. Flo and Kay have what's described by, by doctors as this rigidity of thought these obsessions, these compulsions that are essential to their life to make their life normal. You keep track of these almost every yeah. day? Yes. Dave Wagner was fascinated by Flo and Kay's savant abilities, but also intrigued by their obsessions and compulsions. He filmed a piece about Flo and Kay making their color charts in 1996 for his local news show. You must go through a lot of crayons here. Oh, boy, do we. We always have to buy, buy a new box every year. <laughs> Among many other celebrities, Flo and Kay have been charting Dave's clothes ever since they first saw him on TV. What colors do I wear? All right, now you've got white and black on now. They kept clothing charts on me over the years where they would keep track of the color of clothes I wore on the air. Dave Wagner, Pat St. Jack, Alex Trebek. They keep track of the color of clothes that my wife wore, my children wore. Elaine Lugadano, R.J. Reynolds, I realize they did this for a lot of people. Is this fun to keep track of this? Yeah. You enjoy it? Yeah. Flo and Kay have been watching television obsessively since they were children. Our mom never took us, took us away from our TV. Mom says, you watch your TV, honey. It was a child's program called Captain Kangaroo with Mr. Green Jeans, Mr. Moose, and the horses and the ponies all week, and it was he would call that the captain's treasure house. As they got older, they started to watch game shows on TV. Our grandmother was the one that was starting to watch the game shows. We says, Nan, we're going to come join, join you watching. And to this day, we still do. As they grew up, their obsession narrowed to one game show in particular, the $100,000 Pyramid, hosted by Dick Clark. Ready, one. 
two, three. From Television City in Hollywood, this is the $100,000 Pyramid. Did you come down? Oh, you did. It is the $100,000 Pyramid. It's the end of a week, and we've got to win some money here. Ready. Go. Okay, here we go. Okay, and Thunder. lightning. Uh, yeah, yeah, I sent her. Oh, I'm in love. A very steamy place where you go. Sauna. Uh, when you hit yourself on the head really hard, you've got a... Concussion. Your tangled hair. Your brush. Your brush. Mm -hmm. Since 1974, they've been keeping tabs on the pyramid. Exotic things. A, um, an Asian dancer. Things are exotic. Mm -hmm. They catalogue every question and answer and write down the number of times buzzers and bells sound in the show. Smudge newsprint. Once we had 12 buzzers and 206 bells. When the pyramid stopped being back to back, it went, 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 up, went up to about 10 buzzers oh. and 119 bells. It arranges in the low 70s or the low 80s or sometimes the mid 90s. I think what's going on for these young ladies when they do this is number one, it fits a particular time of day, and of course, this reflection on facts. And individuals who've got a really good memory for facts thrive on that kind of stuff. Oh, no, by the way, typical people watch game shows, too. Um, Flo and Kay's obsession for documenting the pyramid is part of their autism. For the duration of the program, they're able to exercise full control over what goes on in their world. Mm -hmm. All righty. It exercises your brain. And it makes it smell like rubber. <laughs> But mainly, they watched the pyramid for Dick Clark, the show's host. If Dick Clark wasn't hosting it, we wouldn't have watched it. Dick Clark is huge in the United States as a TV personality and game show host. They've idolized him for years, and he's a very important part of their lives. They don't forget any of their his birthdays. When is Dick Clark's birthday? November 30th, 1929. Where was he born? Mount Vernon, New, New York. York. When did he start American Bandstand? August 5th, 1957. Dick Clark was king of the hill in their book. Over the years, Flo and Kay transformed their bedroom with all the photos and souvenirs of their hero. It was like a shrine. They had all kind of stuff, extension cords rigged up to the toilet paper things, candle covers and light covers. Like a teenage girl's room from like 1955. Man, it's like as important as air, I think, to them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they need food and water and air and Dick Clark. <laughs> yeah, this is our, yeah, this is what we use for our personal savior. Here's our really our personal savior. <laughs> oh yeah, well that's that, that was so <laughs> Dick Clark. Flo and Kay's abiding passion for Dick Clark continued over the years. In 1983, age 27. They were uprooted from Irvington, New Jersey, and taken by their parents to live in Florida. Though Flo and Kay were still sheltered, they did get out more. The twins' sense of well-being depended upon everything and everyone staying the same. But once again, their lives were to be turned upside down. After years of depression and alcohol abuse, their mother's health began to fail. She was diagnosed with lung cancer, and died. Oh boy, we oh we were startled because it was late at night. You know, I, I, late at night, any 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 any, any bad news would, would startle us. And then their father's health began to fail too. It was the night of February twentieth, nineteen ninety-five. That's when our father passed away, and that was it. We had fish dinner that night at a restaurant. It was a Restaurant on the beach called Captain's Galley, where we had we had we had uh, pasta. Tommy had surf and turf. Janie had uh, mahi mahi. Frank had fried calamari. Tracy and, and Frankie who both had a piece of flounder and some potatoes and vegetables. Hi, mommy and daddy. The birds are singing you a nice lullaby. In the space of four months, both of Flo and Kay's parents had died. The responsibility of looking after the twins fell to their younger sister, Jane. I took responsibility of the girls. We all decided to live together. Out of all people that can, you know, just take care of them the best, she was, she was the one to do it. Yeah. She had, you know, she had the ability to, you know, they, she knew what they needed. Yeah. Get a timer lights on, it's yeah. gonna tape at two o'clock. 
Yeah. Jane had always loved her sisters and wanted the best for them. Yeah. If this light lights up, it's already programmed. Yeah. Oh. It's programmed to go, oh boy. Now that Jane was caring for them, the twins' lives blossomed. As children, their parents sheltered them. And when they both died, Jane really opened up a whole new world for Flo and Kay. Out of all people that can, you know, just take care of them the best, she was, she was the one to do it. Yeah. She had, you know, she had the ability to, you know, they, she knew what they needed. They got out and explored the world. They got out and walked. They got out and met people and, and uh, gave them really incredible freedom. They had spent years listening to music in their bedroom and singing in private. Now, they got out and sang it in public. This song came out in January of 1974, and we bought the record on January the 19th, 1974, Saturday. See, this is Las Vegas style. Yes, it is. Like what you had done, 1988. Oh, we got one. One. Oh. Oh, now I'm getting bad luck this time. Oh. Uh-oh, here it is. Look at <laughs> this was a golden age for Flo and Kay, and it gave them the confidence to get in touch with the celebrities they'd been listening to and watching on TV. What did you get from them here? What is this and what does it say? Yeah, this is my uh, birthday card, and they got it to me right on time. And I've got uh, pictures of them, of course, and uh, it also includes a little bit of a bonus here with the card. Kind of a uh, perfumed a little uh, paper here that uh, says open and sniff and then it says love ya. They sprayed it pretty heavily. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the first one you ever sent me. <laughs> What'd you write? One DJ in particular captured their hearts. What did she write? <laughs> Nick Sanders. Duty by Nick Sanders. <laughs> When's Nick's birthday? Oh, February 14th, 1963. How long has he worked at the coast? Oh, nine months it was, nine months this past Monday. And what's his girlfriend's name? Oh, we don't remember now. She's sort of like on the ugly side, though. She's, she, she's fat. <laughs> Cutie pie, Nick. But for Flo and Kay, there was only one celebrity who really mattered. If you could meet anyone in the whole world, just one person, who would that be? Dick Clark. Hey, Dick Clark? When I told Dick Clark all about you, he said he wanted to meet you Ooh. on Wednesday. Oh. Dave Wagner filmed a special news item on Flo and Kay going to meet their hero, Dick Clark. Flo and Kay travel deep into the forest of Bush Gardens Miami Reserve. Near the waterfalls, they see a rare and beautiful sight. Not that gorilla in the mist. We're talking Dick Clark. Hi, Dick Clark. How are you? Hi, are you, Dick Clark? How are you, Dick you. Clark? I've heard so much about you. For 25 marvelous minutes, Flo and Kay take their friend on a trip down memory lane. Oh, look at this. Even more stuff. Oh, Michael. Take a look at all this stuff. <laughs> uh, this, this has been read a lot, folks. Oh, I know. Can I get you a new one? Yeah, Dick Clark assumes the role of game show host, firing questions about music and the pyramid. When did the pyramid first go on? Monday, there? March 26, 1973. How do you know that? I don't know that. This is my uh, 48th year in the public eye, and I, nothing like this has ever happened. Can I have a kiss goodbye? Hey, Jack, yeah. Dick Clark. Thank you. For Dick Clark, it's goodbye to two new friends. For Kay and Flo, it's goodbye to one they've known for 21 years. Well, we know your address, so we're right to you. <laughs> this was the happiest day of the twins' lives, a dream come true. Flo and Kay returned to their daily routine, charting the questions on the $100,000 pyramid and writing down the number of times the bells and buzzers sounded. The routines are right to the time, every day, always. Everything is very scheduled. And I we're going to watch that. Dick Clark show from Bush Garden where we're gonna get it taped. Yeah, because we'll be out for a walk. Ooh, we better put sneakers on if we go for a long walk, all right? Yeah. They gotta stay in that routine. One time I didn't have the game show no more. Oh my God, it was like, Frank, we don't have the game show no more. They were mad at me. I mean, they were mad. But when one day the pyramid inexplicably was taken off the air, Flo and Kay became very unhappy. Nope, normally at this time the pyramid would be on, but it's just some other other game, you know, other stuff on here. We're here in the USA Live Cafe with Judge Joseph A. Walker. There's no pyramid, so we were, we were like depressed. 
We were depressed, in other words. When it went off, we didn't feel like talking to nobody. Yeah, we didn't have an appetite, and we would go to bed, but we couldn't go to sleep because we were over. We'd be overtired. Savants, like the two sisters, uh, they have to listen to music. They have to listen to certain programs. They have to make phone calls. And if you say you can't do that anymore, they simply are going to get more anxious or more determined. Hello, my name is Florence Lyman, and I would like to know what is the delay on a $100,000 pyramid? It's been off since four weeks, and... Oh, yeah, last, last time you gave me maybe this and maybe that, I really want to know the date. I hate that. Oh, I can't get it now. I, I, I get that dumb recording say, if you'd like to make a call, please try again. I'm terribly frustrated over this. Worst Yesterday we broke is, down in church. Well, boy, our ter tears are really pouring out. It's what means. We and cried for it. We, we prayed, for, prayed for it to come on. And our mother always used to say, your prayers are always answered, but uh, this time, this time it doesn't work. And then, on December the 8th, 2004, disaster struck for the twins. Dick Clark suffered a stroke. We heard it on Channel 8 News. Oh my gosh, boy, they were all shook up. We took a, a, a picture, and we took a silver cross that our mother gave to us, and we put, propped it up on a stand, and we put a tea light in front of it, and a Bible next to it, and we made our little chapel. Well, which we, we call it our, our little vigil. I used to get the update uh, all the time after Dick Clark had the stroke. I'd get his medical update all the time. And I was important to them, so I would listen. Wait a wait, wait a wait, nothing to happen to him, because Dick Clark is like a distant daddy. He, he, he called us up every, every year for our birthday. <coughs> yeah. But gradually, he made a partial recovery. Thank you. Come on, girls. All right. Have a nice day. And on New Year's Eve 2005, Dave Wagner took Flo and Kay and their sister Jane to New York where Dick Clark would be presenting his traditional New Year's Eve show. God knows what, what will happen next year, and he might, he might not be there. And, and uh, we will we 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 be glad to see Dick Clark. Good morning, everyone. It is a few minutes. Yeah. We will be getting off by 2020 to New York City. Were you emotional? <laughs> 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 I'm a little emotional because because <laughs> oh. <laughs> we are going to be glad to see Dick Clark. It would be the first time they had seen their personal saviour since he had suffered a stroke. Dick Clark was due to appear on a giant screen in Times Square, but Flo and Kay prefer to watch him the way they always have done, on their own, in front of a TV. Here we go. Flo and Kay are eager to see Dick Clark back to his old self. They have travelled a long way for this moment. Oh, yeah, let's see. I had a stroke. Not being I was in bad shape. I did it to myself. I had to walk and talk all over again. It was a long, oh, long time. Oh, let's see. My speech is not perfect, but I'm getting there. Now, you and I have been a part of each other's lives for so many New Year's Eves that I wouldn't have missed this for the world. <coughs> oh, he sounds different now. Oh, that really changed him. They were like overwhelmed by the way he sounded. You know, they were not expecting that. They were just being given information that he's getting better. And they're believing, they're praying, and he's getting so much better. And then when they heard his voice, they were a little upset. And they have a fear because my grandfather died shortly after his stroke. So now I know that's in the back of their minds, and I know they're scared. I, I know they plan to go home and, and pray some more for him. <laughs> They'll never give up. <laughs> Uncertainty is what Flo and Kay most fear. They had lost both their parents, and now it seemed that Dick Clark might die too. But then it got much, much worse. Shortly after their return from New York, their sister Jane suffered a heart attack and died. Flo and Kay's first instinct was to call Dick Clark. I'm a real sad and everything. 
and so it went. And we, we called up Dick Clark. We happened to tell Dick Clark about, about, about Jane passed away. Oh, my God. Their protector and champion was dead. We had a little ceremony. All of us was there, and that was it. We cried in our bedroom. Dick Clark sent us a sympathy card. Your sister is now an, an angel, like I told you over the phone, girls. She's now an angel down and looking at you girls, watching over you, watch every, watching every move and watching every step that you take. So she's in your heart. And we said, yep. Once again, Flo and Kay faced an uncertain future. It had changed everything about Flo and Kay, uh, their, at least their environment for them. Suddenly that security, uh, the, the the younger sister who had protected them their whole life uh, was gone. Flo and Kay stayed on with Jane's husband, Frank, but that was only ever going to be a temporary solution. Frank wanted them to move back up north to live with their brother, Tommy, and his wife, Adrienne. Tommy's their brother. It's their family. You know, you got to take care of your family. You man up and take care of your family, boy. I received a phone call that if we did not take them, he was putting them in a home, and I panicked. I had, I had to threaten him. I said, listen, you got to come get the twins. He didn't want to take them. Flo and Kay were forced to leave behind the life they loved in Florida and head back to New Jersey, where fresh troubles lay in wait for them. I didn't think these girls would be a problem at all until they moved in. Adrienne, their brother's wife, found it difficult to adapt to life with the twins. When you're around them long enough, they wear you down. Flo and Kay are who they are, and there's no change in them. They're unique, and they have obsessions, they have compulsions, but that can make it difficult for some people just because they are so determined to, to go about their routines, and, and it can, to some people, it can be disrupting. You know, where do they go? Where do they end up? And, and who is going to best be able to care for them? Not only make it easier for the family, but make it easier for Flo and Kay, and uh, that concerns me. Over the years, Dave Wagner has maintained close contact with Flo and Kay. When I, when I did some news stories on them, uh, they were thrilled. And I think part of that was it was the first time really in their life that anybody had publicly acknowledged that they were special, that they were unusual and had these amazing gifts. I think that meant a lot to them. And I don't think they had gotten a lot of that in their lives. We, we met our favorite celebrity, Dick Clark. Whenever I see them or talk to them, it's like I, you know, like I had just seen them the day before. We just pick up from there. They're a lot of fun. How's my look? Oh, nice. How are you? How do you like your hair? Better. Nice. Yeah, we had a dye job a little. <laughs> <laughs> Looks pretty good. Dave has a surprise for Flo and Kay. I promised Flo and Kay that I would one day take them to California to see Dick Clark. Dick Clark, the man they describe as their personal savior. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, <laughs> actually, <laughs> oh, that was a surprise. So I'm making good on that promise. Yeah, it's been a while, hasn't it? A lot has happened to the twins yeah. in the 13 years since they met Dick Clark. But they've always felt very close to him. He's always been their source of strength. And it's a dream come true to actually be going to meet him again. Before going back to California, Dave is going to take them back to the place where they were happiest, Tampa Bay, Florida. Q105. Uh, hi, Barbara Boyd. How are you doing? Hey, doing great. What are you up to? Well, we're in Florida doing our documentary. Hey, Kay. Hey. Hey. Well, how are you doing? <laughs> hi. Nice to see you both again. Welcome to my weather center. Hi, Ashley. Hey. Good to see you. Come here. Give me a hug. Oh, my God. Oh, okay. It's been so long. I am Barbara Boyd. How are you doing? <laughs> Flo and Kay have missed the friends and local celebrities who were so essential to their routines when they lived in Florida. This is what we call major, major fun. It gets us uppity and it gets us peppy. We're peppy. They call in at their favorite restaurant where their sister Jane used to work. Girls, look 
Look at you! <laughs> oh, I'm going to cry! Look at you! You guys hey, look... Simone, you know, when Janie, Janie passed away. I know, I almost had a heart. Give me a kiss. Oh, oh mwah. So how are you, You Simone? girls look good. Yeah, you haven't you. changed a bit. You want something to drink? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're going to have coffee. Yeah, we're going to have coffee, Simone. God, I love you. Let me get you something to drink. <laughs> Pretty exciting, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Flo and Kay check out the menu they remember so well. You guys remember the last time you had an omelet here? Yeah, it was Thursday, May 25th, 1995. When was the last time you had veal marsala here? Oh, it was one of the days when Janie was working. It was, it was September the 2nd, 1997. What about uh, spaghetti and meatballs? It was August the 24th, 1992. Ham and cheese omelet. Sounds good. Wherever they go, people can't resist testing their amazing savant skills. When's my birthday? July the 3rd, 1954. I ain't seen you girls in how long? September 17th. Or oh, Hurricane Gordon. It's Ma Maureen and Tony's anniversary? August 3rd, 1979. <laughs> Before flying off to California to see Dick Clark, last stop for Flo and Kay is their nephew Frank's house. I got all your records. <laughs> They're still here, and you guys can have them. It reminds us of our old dang days, where, where we were little girls, too. We always used to collect records. Oh, look. Oh! To Catherine, best wishes. And look, Dick Clark. We call this major fun. Yeah, it's some experience for us. It feels so good to be back here in sunny Florida. Their time in Florida is over. We have to get up tomorrow at 5 o'clock and go, go on a plane. They're at the airport to take a flight to California to meet the man they've idolized for a lifetime, the man they think of as their father, the man they've described as their personal savior, Dick Clark. Back in New Jersey, Adrienne and the twin's brother Tommy are seeking help. You have now two young ladies in your family, and I'm sure that they're pretty uh, persistent in some of their issues and their interests. That's a polite way of putting impossible. Mm -hmm. yes. Dr. David Holmes, who specializes in the problems faced by families with autistic children, meets Adrienne and Tommy to work out some kind of future for Flo and Kay. You can't be the, the sole caregiver 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That is absolutely a formula for disaster. And I hear it in your voice right now. It's like you're on the, on the edge and saying, that's about as much as I have time or energy for. They're here with you because they can't live in Florida by themselves, correct? Absolutely, yeah. So I mean, they would prefer to be in Florida. Of course, but they don't have the capacity to do that. Yeah. But under the current circumstances, this is not going to be tenable forever. And Tom, you probably know that. I mean, Adrian's in tears, and she's saying, you know, the the weight of the of the of the needs of the of your sisters is really hard on her. Let's just do something about that. Let's do it so we now before we have to do it. See, if you wait until you have to do it, then you don't have any choices. Let's get them into a place of their own. They're going to be treated more like adults as opposed to, you know, 53 or 54-year-old little girls that need to be watched after. He feels yep. that he promised his mom that he would never put them away. I tell you, mom would say, Tom, that's a brilliant idea. You're going to get them a place of their own? Not my mom. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't mean sending them to some large institutional setting or even to some large agency that, has, that will take them out of a community. It'll be someplace proximal to where you live, mm -hmm. and it'll be a nice apartment situation, and there'll be staff that will rotate in and rotate out. Most important thing is to treat, train them to live independently. It's clear that crisis awaits Flo and Kay on their return from California. But for now, they're looking forward to seeing Dick Clark, maybe for the last time. We're in Malibu Beach, California driving on Pacific Coast Highway. The only reason why we came out here to see Dick Clark and, and his wife, Carrie, and, and the dogs. They have watched Dick Clark since they were little girls. They have uh, kept track of everything in his life. Dick Clark has kind of been their almost televangelist, almost like a religious figure to them. And this is an opportunity for them to, to see him face to face. But before going to see Dick Clark, the twins stop off at the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The Jacksons, the Jacksons are related to Dick Clark. Really? Oh, fooey. They've arrived at Dick Clark's shrine. 
There is Dick Clark's star. There he is. Oh, Janie, if Janie was here, oh, she would have loved it. Yes. Oh, and is she's missing it all. Ever since they were children, Flo and Kay have been writing to Dick Clark and calling him up. As they kneel by Dick Clark's star, they whistle the theme tune to the $100,000 pyramid. At first I thought, well, okay, they talked to Dick Clark. I'm thinking, okay, fine. Hey, it's Dick Clark. Is, is Flo and Kay available? And he'd be like, yeah, hang on a second, Dick. Turns out they really do talk to Dick Clark. I was like, I would like to talk to Dick Clark. I talked to Dick Clark. It was only for a short bit of time. Dick Clark knows them. He knows their birthdays. He wished them happy birthday. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. That's the best. It was a magical moment for Flo and Kay, when, as young children, Dick Clark appeared to them for the first time on TV. We're going in to see Dick Clark, and we're going to see Carrie. In the intervening years, amidst all the tragedy and upheaval of their lives, he has been the one abiding presence. Welcome. How are you? I am good. How are you? I give you a hug. Dick Clark has said he wants to meet Flo and Kay privately without cameras present. Hello, Carrie. Um, Hello, I'm so glad you could. Hi, Carrie. I remember you in Orla Orlando or Tampa. 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 Tampa, Tampa. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you for coming to California. <laughs> when was the last time we talked? I was trying to remember the last time or, you called or, or the March, office. Or, or March the 4th this year. March the 4th. Yeah. And I bet you could tell me what day of the week that was. <laughs> it was a Tuesday. I have to get a calendar. Was it Tuesday? Was it Tuesday? Was it Tuesday? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what? Come here once, though. I just oh, wanted, right, Carrie. I wanted you to say hello to someone, too. Oh, yeah? Hello. Oh, hi, hi Dick hi. Clark. How are you? Good to see how you. How are you doing? Dick Clark says, hello, Catherine and Florence. How are you doing? I was say, very good. How are you doing? Oh, oh I'm, I'm doing very excellent, good. girls. Honestly, Dick Clark does look good. He looks very good, like if, uh, like he's pretending if nothing ever happened. We we'll have everything to remember Dick Clark by, and like I know, I, I really hate to say, but like if when his time when his time ends, like when he's oh yeah, well, treasure that for the rest of our life till our till our time is up. Yeah, when our time is up, we would like to be buried with all all everything related to Dick Clark in a, in our casket, so that uh, we'll remember him in spirit, and and then he'll remember us in spirit. Yep, so that, there we go. So that, well, that, that's, another, that's another triple red letter day for us. It's a red ruby day, right? Uh, like, <laughs> like scarlet, scarlet red ruby day. It's the best news imaginable. Dick Clark is on the road to recovery. In the course of their 52 years, Flo and Kay have overcome immense difficulties, and the future remains uncertain for them but they do inspire genuine affection among many of the people that know them. It is amazing when you see what Flo and Kay have been through and you think about all the changes in their lives, the deaths of their parents, the death of Jane, their, their close sister, all the ups and downs, the mistreatment that they've suffered over the years, you know, from, from children and from people and the, the shunning in public and all that's gone on in their lives. It's amazing how upbeat and optimistic they are. They're happy everywhere. I, you never really see them kind of down. They always have a good time. I mean, yeah, always. They're always positive. I'm, I've never seen them really too down about anything. We, we smile all the time. We smile when we think about the future, what we're going to do. To me, they're OK. Maybe you say they're handicapped. I don't say so. I say they're maybe a little smarter than we are, because you know they know how to work us. They're survivors, they've been survivors, and they'll continue to be survivors. Some days we would like to be on our own. Sometimes we would like to be, be on our own. For the time being, Flo and Kay are still living in New Jersey with their brother and sister-in-law. This is it. We're all talked out now. 